Is anybody here what one would call an introvert or a shy person? Anybody one of those, right? I knew a lot of those when I was in school, and I was reflecting on this this week as I was preparing this sermon, that there were probably, and maybe some of you qualify, there were a lot of people in school, in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, that were introverts, that were shy people, that other individuals thought were, to use an old phrase, stuck up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, well, they just, they just never talk. They're just, they're just too good for us. Maybe that was school in the 60s and 70s. I don't know. That's where I lived. But now that we're a little more educated about that kind of thing, we come to find out that introverted people are inwardly motivated as opposed to externally motivated lots of times. But I think I can speak truth about this, that a lot of those people that I thought were stuck up, when you got to know them personally, you found out that they were great people. They were just shy. They just weren't as outgoing as I happened to be. And, you know, that's really what happens in a larger sense when you go from knowing about somebody to actually getting to know somebody. I've discovered in my life that sometimes people like myself that stand in front of crowds and are able to, to, to do a pretty good job of engaging folks. I'm not saying I'm those people. A good job of engaging folks. When you meet them in person, sometimes they're not so outgoing. Sometimes they're kind of introverted people themselves and they have a hard time having a conversation with one person. They can captivate a thousand, but not so much when it's just one person. Or the person that you meet that's a, a business owner or an entrepreneur and they just seem like they're just hard driver type person. And then you meet them and you find out they've got flaws. They've got struggles in their lives. Or maybe they're just a crazy, funny person. You just never get to see that because that's not what they get to do in their lives. Well, folks, I want to share with you today this idea. A lot of people know about God, but God becomes very different when you get to know Him personally. I want to share a message with you this morning called God Makes It Personal. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like to ask you to turn to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. And we're going to be in chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. This is known as, even though it's thousands of years old, the New Covenant. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. If you have a Bible like this, great. If it's on your phone or your tablet, that's okay too. If you don't have one at all, just listen along. Or maybe grab somebody and say, can I read on with you today? The New Covenant. Things are going to change. Let me read these. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. God had made a covenant with the Israelites on Mount Sinai after they had been led out of Egypt by Moses. They were on their way to the Promised Land. It would take 40 years. But He delivered a covenant to them. And the first two verses of this passage, out of the four, the first two tell us that covenant didn't work. Listen to this, verse 31 and 32. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And here it is, my covenant which they broke though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Way back in the book of Exodus, and I'm not going to run you around too much today, but I just got to take you a couple of places so you can get context and understand what's going on. Way back in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, God explained the terms of the covenant through Moses. Here's what is, is written in Exodus 19, 4 through 6. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, from their captivity there, and it ended up destroying the Egyptian army in the process when he opened up the Red Sea, let the Israelites through, and then let the water back on top of the Egyptian army. Verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So what he's saying there is, if you'll do what I tell you to do, 
There's, no good, there's going to be no one above you in all the universe. You are going to be my special people. And a little further down in verse 8, the people said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Unfortunately, they did not do. didn't take them very long to not do, as a matter of fact. They were worshiping idols before you could speak almost. So, but because they had said that, God said, all right, you guys understand that If you do this, then this is what I'll do. So I'll go ahead and give you the law. That started with the Ten Commandments and then all the law that's written about in the first five books of the Bible and repeated and repeated and repeated all through the Old Testament. The focal text for today makes it clear, though, that Israel broke the covenant. And I'll add again and 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 again over and over and over again. Don't get too tough on the Israelites, though. If we had been there, we would have done the same thing, quite frankly, in that day. Hebrews 8, 7 says this, For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Okay? The fact is, though, that it didn't work was not God's fault. Folks, don't ever get in this mindset that God makes mistakes. Don't ever think that God went, whoops. That's not who God is. God knew everything. God knows everything. Matter of fact, God knew you'd be here today. Listen to this message. So if you're thinking, what is he doing talking about stuff that happened 3,000 years ago plus? Plug in. It's going to get to today. Count on it. Here's the, here's the reality of things, though. A good Israelite, quote unquote, good Israelite in those days, thought that following the letter of the law made them righteous. If they kept the law then they were good, and God was going to let them into heaven when they died. We even see that over in the New Testament, where people that Jesus was dealing with, they're like, I kept the law. Well, the reality is they didn't keep the law. Jesus made that pretty clear. He said, yeah, the law says you shouldn't kill. But if you think thought, bad thoughts of people, if you hate people in your heart, you've already killed them. i got to think when he said that, there was a whole bunch of uh-oh stuff going on. Because that was not what people wanted to hear, because they're thinking, well... My neighbor stinks. That guy's a creep. Wait a minute. I just killed him? Whoa. But here's the problem. Is even though they kept the law, what they did was they were going through the motions. Well, the law tells me to not walk any further than this on the Sabbath. The law tells me that if I do something wrong that I have to sacrifice. The law tells me all these different things that I must do. So therefore, I will keep the law. I will keep the letter of the law. If you will, it's the same idea that if you're out here on Queen K driving between here and Waikoloa, you're going to drive 45 exactly and no more when it says 45 and 55 and no more exactly when it says 55. And you'll make sure somehow that when it goes from 40, 55 to 45, that uh, and down the 45. I don't know how that works, but I broke that law yesterday and the day before yesterday and the day before yesterday when I was up there, by the way. So I guess this confession for me today. News alert, God really wasn't that amped on Israel keeping the law. Did you hear that? He wasn't that amped on them keeping the law. What he wanted was their hearts. He wanted them to love them. He said over in Deuteronomy 6, I want you to love me with your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. That's actually the New Testament translation of that. But nonetheless, he wanted them to. Not their obedience, because if they loved him, they would obey him. More on that in a few minutes. So you're saying, now you're just talking stuff from 3,000 years ago. This has nothing to do with anything about us. Well, yeah, it does. Because the reality is, today in the world, many professing Christians, people who are attending churches, who read their Bible, all of that kind of stuff, think that they have to keep the law. They do it all the time. But all the law does, and I was kind of cheating this a little bit when I was talking about the speed limit, is it provides basic boundaries. Pay your taxes, don't kill people, don't speed, those sorts of things. But Christianity, to a lot of folks, and I've been guilty of this many, many years of my life because of my upbringing in the South, where I was in the Bible Belt, and all that kind of stuff, it really came down to the idea that you just wanted to make sure that you checked off a bunch of boxes every week so that you pleased God with your actions. If you don't believe that, how many of you are, grew up in church? Anybody? Anybody grew up in a Southern Baptist church other than me? All right, I got a couple of you. 
I remember this so clearly. Every year in December, when I was a kid, and it went into my adult life, but I particularly remember this as a kid, sometime in December, actually that's not true, was that true? Actually it was actually in August, because we, our, our fiscal year in the church was September to August, all right? I had to think about that for a minute. Because um, they, they ran the church year with the school year, basically, is how they did it. Because everybody was, was graduated to the next class when school started for Sunday school. Some of you guys are looking at me like, what are you talking? Sorry. Just having a flashback to my, to my youth. Um, every year, though, in August, they would come out and they would give you a new box of what? Offering envelopes. A new box of offering envelopes. <laughs> Those Southern Baptist church people, we got to collect the offering now. Come on. And what was amazing about those is you'd open them up, and I mean, it, it was, it was uh, you know, you open a box, ah, that smells so good, uh, and, and you had your number on it, and in the middle of the envelope, it had your number in red, because that's how they, they tracked it in the, the bookkeeping in the church. And it had a picture, a little drawn picture of the church on the side that they probably paid a ton of money for. But down one side of it, they had six little check boxes. Anybody remember that? Anybody remember that? I had to write it down so I could remember. I looked it up again. There were six check boxes that when you brought your offering in each week, I, I was in bondage like you wouldn't believe as a, as a seven-year-old. I got to tell you, I really was in bondage on this stuff. Um, there was one box that you checked if you were present. I'm thinking, duh, I'm here. I gave you the envelope. <laughs> there was another box checked if you brought your Bible. That was easy. Just had to get it under your arm and get it there. My, my big, thick, it was about this big. When you're a seven-year-old, it was really huge. King James Bible, right? Get that under my paw, under my arm. It was. It was King James, absolutely. And that day, that's all, really all there was. Yeah, when I was a kid. I won't tell you when that was. This is the one that got me messed up. You ready? Bible read daily. That was a checkbox. And me and my seven-year-old brain went, I read it twice this week. Does that count? Or, or here was the worst. I read it six times. Oh, I don't get to check the box. Lesson studied. Whatever. That didn't. No. Lesson studied. Come on. Then there was one giving. Again, duh. Here it is. Right? It never occurred to me as a kid that I could give them the envelope without money in it. That would have short-circuited some people, I think. And then the last one I had no control over because I was a kid. Worship attendance. Mom and dad didn't say, oh, you can sit outside. No, you're going to church. I got in so much trouble when I was a little bit older because my friend Chris Garrett and I would skip de dip with, with our, I won't tell you where the money came from, with our money over to the 7-Eleven to buy candy between Sunday school and worship and then come back and wrinkle candy wrappers during the worship service. Oh, man. Sorry. Yeah, just... Just, I mean, I'm backslidden, as, as backslidden as I could be. Folks, that was torture for me. That thing was torture for me because I wanted to check every box. I don't think I ever lied about that because then I would have to make up a line that said lied and check that box. But <laughs> I, I, it, it was just, you know, but that, that, was a, that was a microcosm of my life as a, as a Christian when I was a child and a teenager and a young adult. And you might have been in the same boat. You may be there today. It's all about checking the boxes, right? And, and you're just hoping somebody's going to give you an attaboy because you check five out of six. That is not what the Christian life is about. But that's what the old covenant was all about, keeping the law. So let me ask you this one. I want to just do a kind of a, 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 a gut check, and I'm going to be careful because I'm going to, this is going to just take forever, and I want to make sure I get you guys out of here on time. Let me just ask you a question. Is your faith today external, or does it reach to your heart? I, I just want to have a come-to-Jesus moment here this morning, folks. I mean, a lot of you are going, geez, I just wanted to go sit under a tent. <laughs> yeah, surprise. If you're going to be here, let's, let's make it worth your while. And, and if it's in your heart, hallelujah, give God the glory right now. Just, just throw up a praise. Say, thank you, Jesus. I got something more than just a check in the box kind of faith. Check in, checking the box. It's not like jack in the box. Checking the box kind of faith. But folks, we have to understand something here that God knew this about people. When he put the covenant in place, he knew he couldn't keep the law. That was never a surprise to God, remember? God's never surprised by anything. And so he knew that 
to be able to have a relationship with you and with me and every other human on this earth, something had to change. And the first part of that is the heart had to change. Listen to what he says over in Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel in verse chapter 36, verses 26 and 7. This is God talking through the prophet says this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone. Because that's what the person who obeys the law is. It's a stone heart. We're just keeping checking the boxes. Take the stone of heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. God would make it personal. He would become a very personal God because folks, don't ever tell me I'm religious. You seem like a religious person. You might just tell me I'm a jerk. I don't want to be religious. Religion is about man basically cheating God and putting a bunch of trappings together to try to please God. If we love him with all we are, the rules won't matter. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What he was saying was, if you really love me with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're not going to be banging up against my rules because you will stay in my love and obedience to me. Parents, Grandparents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your obedient child, your loving child, is you're not going to have to give them all these rules about. And, and I'd say the same thing to your spouses. You know, if you love your spouse, they're not going to have to come to you and say, well, you know, you shouldn't cheat on me. Right? That, that just shouldn't even be an issue. That shouldn't be a conversation topic. I love you. I would never do that. You know, or, you know, you need not to be, I'm going to be very happy with you if you come in at 2 a.m. drunk and stoned. And start tearing the house up. If you love your spouse, you're not going to do that. Or if you love your parents, you're not going to do that either. And so this idea of the law was, to, was when I don't love you, I just need to know what my boundaries are. And if you're like I was, and sometimes still am, unfortunately, if I know where the line is, where's my foot? Boom! Right up on it. And sometimes sneak a couple of toes over the line as well. I don't know if anybody else runs into that. You're saying, and you're preaching this morning? Yeah, I am. So here we are. Remember, Jesus is the only perfect one. So uh, here we are. Here's the deal, though. For all of that, many are tempted to still look to that covenant of stone for their answers. And that's where we come to the provisions of the new covenant. And they're really just three. The first one is this. And if you're still over in Jeremiah 31, look at the first part of verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. Heart and mind. Folks, let me give you three words to equate to that that maybe our 21st century mind can grab onto a little bit better. Intellect, emotion, and here's one, will. Intellect, emotion, and will. That's pretty much who we are, right? That drives everything in our lives. And folks, let me just say this to you. If God's got your heart and your mind, he's got all of you. If he's got your heart and your mind, you are his. Now, how God would do this, how he put his law in our hearts and our minds is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. That's not something that you just get when you come into this life. And that would be such a different dynamic than the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come upon people and leave people and come upon people and leave people. But the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is something that only happens through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not something that you've got to wait on. It's not something you've got to do a whole bunch of stuff for. When you accept Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord, you are, boom, indwelt with the Holy Spirit from that time forward. And he's really the one that should be running your life. I don't know about you guys, and I say this to this group, they probably get tired of it from time to time, but it's not about me being good. It's letting me, sur me surrendering my will to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I find that when I try to be Jesus, I do a really horrible job. Anybody else in the same boat? But when I surrender my life, and that's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And people have, for years have been like, what's that all about? That seems pretty spooky. No, being filled with the Holy Spirit means you surrender your will you let him control your life that's it so you get up in the morning and say what do you want me to do today lord show me lead me 
control me. That's a word that people don't like very much, but that's really what it is. And because of the Holy Spirit's indwelling and leading, the believer is connected to God at a much deeper level. Let me read you one more verse. This, and I eventually get to the New Testament today. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 16. Let me just read this to you. This is Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Let me pause there. Christians, does it ever irk you when non-believers, non-Christians, do stuff that just makes you mad? You You ever get there? You ever get there? You see the world out there and they're doing some of the goofiest things and the most awful God-hating things. You know where I'm going from? They don't know any better. Why do we keep trying to put our Christian template over top of people that are not Christians? Why do we do that? You'd be doing the same thing if you didn't know Jesus. The reason that the natural man does not receive the things of God, he says here, for they are foolishness to him, nor can we know them, can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. And then Paul finishes this passage with this. For he, sorry, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And folks, that word, Mind there, the form of that word mind is the same word that's used over in the Greek translation of Jeremiah 31, 33 that we just read. Romans 5, 5 tells us that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So think of it this way. Through the Holy Spirit's entry into the life of a believer, he has converted our hearts and our minds in complete fulfillment of the New Testament. Now, I meant to say this, and I want to step back just for a second because you're saying, well, he's saying all this to Israel. Please understand that the New Testament makes us understand that we who are believers have been grafted in with the, the faithful of Israel. So this, this message, this promise is for believers as well as it is for those who are obedient to God in the nation of Israel. So provision one is internal change. The second provision is an intimate relationship. Continuing on in, in Jeremiah 31, verse 33, the second part, he says this, And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? They will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Now, folks, what this doesn't mean is that we have been absolved from our responsibility to tell other people about Jesus. That's not what that means. What this means is that you're not going through the new covenant, through Jesus Christ, that no one is going to have to go through somebody else to have a close personal relationship with God. I have people sometimes come to, come to ask, people come to ask me to pray for them all the time and to pray for circumstances, and I'm always glad, happy to do that. I love to partner with you in praying for situations in your life. But occasionally I get somebody who comes to me at a little different level and they say, Pastor, will you pray? And it's more of the idea of you've got a closer connection to God than I do. Will you pray on my behalf? Folks, that's not my place. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the same access to Jesus Christ as I do. You don't need to go through me. You don't need to go through an intermediary. You can go directly to Jesus Christ. Now, by contrast, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, when you pray, He doesn't hear you. Until you pray this, Jesus Christ, I confess my sin. Please forgive me for my sins. I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe that you died for me on the cross and that your blood is sufficient to save me from all my sin and to give me a relationship with God the Father. I put my trust and my faith in you and I believe you and you will lead my life from this day forward. Boy, I'm getting chicken skin on that one. When you pray that, that opens the communication line up. Up until then, you're not his. And so if you have friends that are, you know, they're out there doing their yoga or their whatever, and that's their basis for life, 
They don't know Jesus. And they say, I'll pray for you. Don't be a jerk about it, but it's not really going to help. Right? Just trying to say. So I just want you to catch that. And folks, Christmas, the reason this message is here today is for this. Christmas marks the point in history when a child was born who was God incarnate. Emmanuel, God with us. Not some faraway God, but a God who could be touched and who touched billions of people on this earth over the last 2,000 years. It's not just a historical fact. This is an up-to-minute reality for every person who has truly put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. And Jesus told his disciples, and this holds true for us today who are disciples of his, those of you who become followers of Jesus Christ, this promise is for you as well. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the first provision is, is, is internal change. The second provision is an intimate relationship. And the third is infinite forgiveness. This is the last part of verse 34. And this is really the how this is all possible. One sentence. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. When God consummated the covenant on Mount Sinai, animals were sacrificed and their blood was sprinkled on the people. And that process continued for many hundreds of years after that. The sacrificial system where they would slay bulls and goats and all of that. But Hebrews 10.4 tells us that the blood of animals cannot take away sin. It was a covering, if you will, preparing for the day when Jesus would come. But John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he told his disciples... Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The new covenant had been sealed with a blood sacrifice. This time, though, it would be the blood of our perfect, holy, and righteous Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus died innocently, without sin, on Calvary's cross, taking our place, shedding His blood to pay for your sin and for mine. And then He arose again three days later, Ushering in the new covenant. And Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, there it is again, that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. He'll save you from your sin, He'll forgive you for your sin, and He will give you entry into an eternal relationship with His Father. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you're still under the old covenant. I just want you to catch that today. Just kind of connect the dots all the way back to the beginning. You're still under the old covenant. You're under the law. And you can only come under the new covenant by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and allowing His grace to save you and to forgive you for your sin. He wants to change your heart and your mind today. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you today. He's ready to forgive your sins if you're ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. To those of you who've already accepted Jesus as your Savior, are you really living under... The new covenant. I asked the question earlier, so I want to come full circle with you guys as well. Or are you still living under the old covenant? God wants a personal relationship with you every day and in every way. He wants you to desire Him for who He is, not just check a bunch of boxes. Yes, He wants you to sing praises. He wants you to read His Word. He wants you to be active in the church. But He wants you to do it because you love Him. Not because somebody told you to do that. Allow Him to give you a heart of flesh that loves Him and longs for Him. Folks, God has gotten personal with you. I invite you to get personal with God today.